Why don't we just give the Lord a wave offering today? Amen. Hallelujah. Lord, we just thank you for your precious holy word. We thank you for the spirit of God in our life that makes us a living reality, O oh God. And we thank you, Lord. <laughs> it's your... It, it's the Creator's handbook, Lord, to tell us how to live and how to, what we're to do and, and what you want to do in our life and who we are and who you are and who you are in us and who we are in you, O oh God. And we just thank you for moving by your Spirit and open our, as we open our hearts today, God, that your, your Word will be illuminated to our understanding. And then we'll not just be hearers of the word, but we'll be doers of the word. And we'll prove that good, acceptable, and perfect will that you have for each one of our lives. That you and your kingdom will be glorified here on earth and for eternity. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, well, if you want to, turn your Bibles to Matthew. Do, do it whether you want to or not. If you've got your Bible, turn your phone or whatever you use, just turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 8. I'm, we want to talk today about how authority, spiritual authority and faith work together. Hallelujah. So important. Here in Matthew chapter 8, beginning, uh, we're going to begin with verse 5. Hallelujah. Verse 5. This is, a, this is the centurion that came to Jesus because of his sick servant. He says, now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. Isn't it amazing? In the scriptures, Jesus never refused healing to anyone. He was already always willing to heal whoever would come for healing or whoever needed healing, whether they could get to him or not if they... They come to him, they could get healed. And he says here, and the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, uh, Surely I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. You know, if, if he could find faith, one place he would have been to find it was in Israel. This is God's covenant people. God, the, the people uh, that he... He lived among, and the people that he'd shown so many miracles to and done so many miracles for, th that's where he should have found faith, great faith. But he hadn't. And I wonder if he looks at the church today and thinks the same. Hallelujah. Well, you know, faith is a spiritual force from God. We know that, don't we? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. And uh, faith can't come if we are in rebellion against God's authority. See, this man understood authority. Authority. Doubt is a spiritual force from the devil. A lot of people don't understand that. Doubt, doubt's a spiritual force. And faith cannot come or operate if you're in doubt. So we have, to, we have to learn to keep doubt out of our heart by staying under authority and in faith. You know, there's two important matters in the universe. The first one is trusting, that's putting faith in, God's salvation that Jesus has paid such a price for each one of us. 
Faith in what he did in his death, burial, and resurrection. Make him Lord, supreme authority. Lord, supreme authority. Jesus is supreme authority in our lives. Amen? Because God's given all his authority unto the Son. And, and really, Jesus has given his authority to every believer. But we must stay under his authority in order for that authority to work for us in this world that we're still living in. And another important thing is obeying that authority, obeying his authority. That's the second thing. Say, trust and obey. Trust and obey. Disobeying God's authority is lawlessness, sin. Now, all authority is from God, so all authority is spiritual. You know that? If it's from God, it's spiritual. All authority is from God. Now, if any delegated authority... Well, let's, let's look at a scripture in Romans chapter 13, verse 1 and 2, because this is a scripture people go to a lot of times, and a lot of people don't understand this scripture. They think we should never come against the government for anything. Well, that was the case. They sure mis disobeyed God in the Bible. When the government told the disciples they couldn't worship God, they, they would get beaten, thrown in prison, killed, but they obeyed God and not man. So here in Romans chapter 13, verse 1 and 2, it says, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. Now this is talking about good authority here. But we know good authority, there's also abusive authority, you know. And um, all authorities from God, so all authorities are spiritual. The exception to this is if any delegated authority, that is government, family, church, wherever, school, tells you to make you do anything contrary to what God, the ultimate authority, tells you, you don't have to obey it. But you need to make sure where, we, where you're at in that. Amen? So when is delegated authority abusive and we shouldn't obey? Let me give you an example of something that's not abusive. Because it's happened to me, and I'm sure it's happened to most anybody. Anybody here ever been stopped by the police? Come on now, be honest. Your pastor's hand was up. I've been I've been stopped a couple of times going up south of Randolph Avenue, but the last time I really got I I, I really got the word. The last time, you know, uh, that speed limit going out on South Randolph as you go out to where we live in Hunter's Inlet, um, is 25 miles an hour. Now, that, they'll, they'll, give you to, they'll give you to 30. They won't bother if you drive 30. And most people, you know, know that, and they'll drive about 30. But if you get, if you, if you get up to 35 miles an hour, they will stop you if they catch you. And I know one morning coming to church, I crossed the railroad track from out of Hunter Inlet there, you know, and I, I got there right there where uh, um, the dog and pet place is there uh, on the right over there. Policeman had somebody pulled over, and I said, man, I hate that. You know, I was going, <laughs> and... Uh, he was getting through writing that ticket, and he put the siren on me. He said, I was doing 35 miles an hour in a 25-mile zone. Well, now that's not abusive authority. I was, I was disobeying the uh, law ordinance. And uh, 
and uh, he, he got me. And, uh, you know, now if, if he had uh, if I stopped my car and, and, you know, jerked me out of the car and handcuffed me and threw me in the police car, arrested me, then that would be abusive authority because all I was doing was doing 35 miles an hour in a 25-mile zone. I, I, and, and uh, you know, so, you know, when that happens, you be pleasant, you talk pleasant to the officer. You, don't, you never have to talk unpleasant to them, regardless of what the situation is. And uh, I've, I've learned to do that, you know. I've been stopped enough to, to know to do that uh, in my lifetime, and, um, and it's less than probably a half a dozen times that I've been stopped in my life, and I'm, you know, I'm not young. But, you know, I was pleasant to him, you know, and he was pleasant to me, and he you know, got my license and my insurance stuff and checked me out, you know, and he come back and he said, well, I'm not going to give you a ticket. I'm going to give you, just give you a warning so it's no, it won't go on your record and all. But now, if I'd, see, he checked me out, and if there'd been some warrants, he could arrest me. And if I'd been ugly with him, and resisted him if he had, you know, come back with, you know, saying that I had warrants and all. He could get ugly too. And that wouldn't be abusive. That'd be him doing his job. So I told this officer when they got through, I said, I really appreciate you out here doing your job. I just wasn't thinking, trying to get to where I needed to go. I had, you know, get to work. And, and uh, I, I, I appreciate you out here doing your job. And uh, anyway, uh, there wasn't any abusive authority there. But we know there is abusive authority. There's abusive authority in the homes. Let me tell you, if you're, if you're a, a woman or, and you're a believer and your husband's not a believer and your husband tells you you can't go to, uh, go to uh, church, what you going to do because what, what's God told us to do? He's told us to gather together, not to forsake this assembling of ourselves together. So are you going to obey God or are you going to obey an abusive husband? And we know, you know, many husbands can get abusive. And, you know, women can get abusive. Wives can get abusive. It's not as common, you know. But uh, it can happen. Uh, I've, I've known of situations. You know, when you pastor a church, as long as we have, you, you know all the situations that come up in people's lives. But anyway, we've got to learn to trust authority. As long as that authority doesn't tell us to disobey God, we should submit to it. Amen. As long as it's not abusive. If we don't, it affects our faith. Because if we don't submit to it, here's what's going to happen. See, there's two spiritual kingdoms here that's in conflict. I, I, I assume, I trust y'all have figured this out. You have God's kingdom, and you have a, uh, the devil's kingdom of darkness, Satan's kingdom. That's the two kingdoms that uh, mankind is confronted with. God's kingdom is established on authority. Did you know that? God's kingdom is established on authority. Satan's kingdom is established on rebellion. So that right there should tell you why we cannot get over into the principle of Satan's kingdom. Certainly your faith could not work. We're to walk, we're to walk, we're to live by faith in our God and his word. So, God's kingdom, see, established on authority, is a kingdom of light, love, Life, God kind of 
of life. And we obey His authority, we'll be highly blessed. And let me say this, you cannot be in authority if you're not under authority. Can't be in authority if you're not under authority. Some people want, oh, I want to be in authority, you know. I want, you know, I want this position, I want that. But they're not under, they're not under authority. Did you know I have to be under spiritual authority that's under God? I got a hold of this principle not long after I got saved. Really when I started reading the Bible. Pastors need pastors. Satan's kingdom sees established on rebellion. And when we, if we as believers get in rebellion, we are in conflict with God and his kingdom. We're operating the principle of Satan's rebellion. And uh, the scripture tells us, for rebellion is as the spirit of witchcraft, divination, 1 Samuel 15, verse 23. It's as the spirit of witchcraft. Did you know, if we get into rebellion, we get, we're jumping into witchcraft? So we don't want to. We don't want to get in it, and we don't want. We, we want to make sure we stay out of it. And if we've gotten in it, we better get out of it. Because we won't. I don't know about you, but I, I, I tell you, I, I need some great faith. Amen. I want some great faith like this. Uh, this centurion had here, and that's. I'm, we're just going to look at some major keys here uh, to great faith. Number one. We must have a thorough understanding of submission and authority. That's where it begins. A thorough understanding. Romans 1.17 says, For it is the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. We've been justified by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith in, that he was resurrected from the dead. You know, he was resurrected from the dead for our justification. Where we could stand before a holy God justified when we accepted what he did for us through his death, burial, and resurrection. And we have the example here of this centurion above that we just talked about here. The scripture we read there in Romans chapter 8. You know, uh, an essential element of great faith is humility. See, people of great faith don't have much faith in themselves. You know, if we start having all this faith in ourselves, then we, we don't need God. See, people that think, you know, they get so uh, uh, tied up with what they can do that they don't think they need God. Those who have great faith in themselves have a trouble depending on God. Now this Saturn here, was, he was capt uh, captain of a hundred soldiers, Roman soldiers. That's one sixteenth of a Roman legion of 6,000 soldiers. Evidently, from what the scriptures tell about, about the man and what the Jews thought of him because of his generosity to, the, to them and their, their religion, uh, he was evidently a godly man judging from what the, the, the uh, uh, evaluation of the Jews upon him. Some scholars even think this was possibly Cornelius that you read about over in Acts. Remember Cornelius, the centurion? 
I don't know whether that's true or not, but centurion was also a godly Roman soldier, a centurion, over a hundred soldiers, Roman soldiers. But this centurion, and, and just like Cornelius, they recognize Jesus as having a superior authority to the Roman government. You know, it says that Jesus marveled at his great faith. There's only two times it says Jesus marveled that I can find in the Gospels. Only twice. Here, and the, and the Jews' unbelief in him in his hometown. He marveled at their unbelief. This centurion had faith in Jesus' word. He understood authority. He knew Jesus said you could speak the word, just speak the word only, and his servant could be healed, which he did. He believed the spoken word of Jesus was sufficient to produce the miracle that he needed. And the, and the Bible is full of all kind of examples we have in the Bible. Uh, we have, you know, Abraham's obedient to God when he, when, he, when, he, when he told him to sacrifice Isaac, his only son. What great faith, what great belief in the authority that Abraham was under. Now, he knew that he had Isaac because God promised it to him and gave, it to, gave this son to him in, in his old age. I can't imagine God giving me and Donna a son in our age, and we're not, we're not as old as Abraham was, which was in good shape. But he knew because of the promise of God to him that if he had to sacrifice his son, God would raise him from the dead. He didn't squall and bawl all the way up that mountain. Like the movie is projected, you know. He obeyed his God and he knew if he had to kill his son that God would raise him from the dead because of the promise God had made him through his seed. Isaac. Moses, obedient, obedience and submission to God's authority when, when, when told to stretch that rod out over the Red Sea. Elisha uh, healing Na 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 Naaman, the Syrian. Joshua giving those specific instructions on how to take Jericho. He had to, you know, he understood he understood authority, and he understood his faith in that star. Then we have Peter and the disciples, you know, uh, I, after, even after Jesus, you know, that Jesus, they'd fished all night, and Jesus told them, well, cast your net on this side over here. And uh, they, they'd fished all night and caught nothing, but when they did what, when they obeyed the authority of Jesus' word to them, they had more fish than they could bring in. So the key here is being under Christ's authority and lordship. Let's move on here. Another major key here to having great faith. You know, we know this. Uh, we know that there... Not, this is not necessarily an everyday thing, but there are times in our lives when we need to hear some specific instructions from the Lord. Uh, we need to not only hear the Word, but we need to hear the Spirit and the Word. So God's calling all of us at times to various times to new levels of faith. We don't want to stay with little faith. 
faith should be growing in our lives. So God may be calling, I believe he's calling all of us now to take a greater step of faith and to experience a, fresh, a new freshman in our walk with him. But here's another uh, key. We must worship the Lord with reverence. Amazing how many of y'all don't get here when we start worship. I know I'm meddling, but I got authority to do it. We must worship him, the Lord, with reverence. Matthew 8, 1, 3 says, When he had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus put out his hand, touched him, saying, I am willing to be cleansed. And immediately the, his leprosy was cleansed. The word worship here means he to prostrate oneself in homage, to, to revere, to adore. And that's what this man did. He really worshiped the Lord. The Lord told Joshua when Joshua 5, 13 through 15, it said, And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandals off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. The word worship here is to bow down in homage to, to the royalty uh, of God and do reverence. It's, called even, it's even called the fear of the Lord. It's not a, a, a unholy to be scared of the Lord. It's a fear that you want to, of reverence in Him for who He is. Honoring him for who he is. And, and before God really can speak a word of faith into our ears, we must have an attitude of worship and reverence towards him. He said here it's holy ground. You know, we need to understand that we, we, we need to be holy ground. We, we need to get the carnal clutter and it's times we need to, you know, get all that uh, time and should be a time daily when we get all that out of our life and spend some time in the presence of the Lord. And, you know, repenting if we need to repent of something. Repent means to turn from. Repent and get serious with God. Now here's another major keys. Number three, if you're taking notes. Be convinced of Jesus' ability and what you believe. Be convinced of Jesus' ability and what you believe. Matthew 9, 28, And when he had come into the house, the blind man came to him, and Jesus said to him, Do you believe that I'm able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. See, we need to be fully convinced that God is able to do what He has promised through His Son, Jesus Christ. You know, the Bible says, all the promises of God are yes and amen to the glory of God. So let's find those promises when we need them. Get in the Word of God where the promises are. Find those scriptures that promises you that He has met the needs you have in your life. Because he's already done it. The promise is there. Abraham, see, was convinced of what God had spoken to him so much that he never wavered at the promise that he gave him concerning his son Isaac. He was fully convinced. Romans 4, 20 through 22 says, Talking about Abraham, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised he was also able to perform. 
and therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. Because he had spoken to Abraham through covenant that Isaac would be his heir. And it happened even, even in his old age. He believed in the power of the covenant that God had established with him. Do you know, you have to understand, you're in covenant with God. You are in a blood covenant with God. Blood covenant. I thank him every day for all the benefits of that covenant that blood covenant through his son, Jesus Christ. We have the greatest covenant that could be for a human being on the face of the earth. A covenant with almighty God through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So he, he believed in that covenant. He had a blood covenant. Abraham had a blood covenant with God. God had established with him, that with him, and was, he was convinced of this. And, a, and as a result, great faith came forth in the life of Abraham. As a matter of fact, we call him the father of faith. That's quite a that's a quite a uh, honor for any human being to be called the father of faith. That's what Abraham is called to this day. The father of faith. It always it started with Abraham. God found a man he could really believe. That could, would believe him. Of course, we know may Adam had faith until he threw, threw it all, gave it all, gave it away, gave his faith away. That's why we have the mess that he manages in today. Number four. Press in spite of any kind of obstacles you see in your life. Luke chapter 8, verse 45, 46 says, And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied it. I tell you, that throne of people touching him. He said, Who touched me? Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitude thrown you and press you, and you say, Who touched me? But Jesus said, somebody touch me, for I perceive power going out of me. In other words, what the Lord was saying is, somebody touched me with faith. And I felt power going out of me. Of course, we know the story of the woman with the issue of blood. She had pressed through all those obstacles that, pre that was trying to present, prevent her from getting to the Lord where she could touch even just touched his clothing, the hem of his garment. And she was healed of this terrible blood disease. Spent all, where she'd spent all she had on doctors. And they couldn't help her. But she heard about Jesus. And she heard it more than once. She heard about Jesus. She heard about Jesus. And she heard that Jesus is going to be a certain place. And she wasn't even supposed to be out among people. That was quite an obstacle, wasn't it? Yeah. You could be stoned to death. But she pressed in anyway, regardless of the obstacles. And there are many obstacles that confront us, confront our faith. Disillusions, disappointments, worldly cares and distractions, trials and tribulations, they're going to try to cause you to lose heart and not press in. 2 Corinthians 4, 8, 9 says, We are 
Paul said, we're hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Then in, in 2 Corinthians 4, 16, it says, Therefore we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. Outward man is perishing, but the inward man is being renewed day by day. And the same power that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us, and it will quicken your mortal body. It'll keep that thing going as long as you need it. It'll keep that suit, that earth suit healthy as long as God needs, needs you in that earth suit here. I believe he's promised you at least three score and ten, and all you can believe for after that, up to 120. Donna, uh, Dorothy's like Ken Copeland, you know, she's going to. She's going to live to be 120. I'm also going to believe God for every, every year I can believe for after three score and 70, 70 years, three score and 10. If I get that great, and I believe God's still needing me for something, I'll, I'll be there. Amen. Just want to finish the course. See, he has a, he has a plan. He has a course. He has a he has it all laid out for you, every individual believer. And we don't need to let the devil come and, and rob you, kill you. So that's his purpose. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And uh, you don't need to go out prematurely. So many believers die prematurely. So, in conclusion, we, have to, we, we choose God's kingdom over Satan's kingdom. Amen? We, we choose life over darkness. Hosea 2.6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Well, we have a book of knowledge. Get into, get into the, the knowledge we need. Find the knowledge we need. Amen. Get it in your heart. Faith only comes to us when we are under and submissive to God and His delegated authority. You know, 1 Peter 5, 5 through 9, we won't look at the Scripture there, but we know, that, we know the Scripture says, Submit to God and resist the devil and he'll flee from you. I see a lot of believers that are, that are resisting, trying to resist the devil, but they're not submitted to God. They're not even in church. They're not under a pastor. Boy, I tell you, when I got saved, I wanted you just to get as close to my pastor as I could. And, I, and I've tried to stay close to him ever since. Of course, he's in California now. But we, we talk on the telephone consistently. Amen. He calls me and I call him. And, and, and thank God he's moving back. Y'all pray that his house will sell out there where these people can get back to God's country. <laughs> Hallelujah. Resist the devil. Oh, they resist the devil, but, you know, but they're not submitted. We have to be submitted unto God. And you can't see God, but you can see his delegated authority. We have to stay submitted to that authority unless that authority tells us to disobey God. Or so this, this example, you're working for someone. You're, you should be loyal to that person you work for. You should do what that person tells you to do uh, unless they tell you to do something that you know violates your faith, violates your conscience then you shouldn't do it. This is what I couldn't understand during all this COVID mess. Uh, we had uh, people being fired because their conscience wasn't letting them take that vaccine. If 
thousands and thousands and thousands, maybe, a, maybe up to a million people refused to take that vaccine because it violated their conscience, their faith. And they lost their jobs. Well, any time, if you want a job, your employer tells you to do something that violates your conscience, your faith, and what the Word of God says, then you shouldn't do it. God's got something better for you. But until then, you ought to be giving that employee a, a day's work for a day's pay and being obedient to him. And sometimes it boils down to that supervisor that the boss has put over you. Getting quiet in this Presbyterian church. No, you got to stay submitted to God. Why? And, and, and the reason, listen, God, God has, he, he wants us to, to walk, to live in greater faith. He don't want you to stay over in a little faith. You know, uh, he wants you to receive all the promises of God that's, that he's given us through his son, Jesus Christ. When we need them, receive them. They're, they're for us. Amen? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.